We praise the Lord because you are able to make it. You will always make it. Amen. I will thank the Lord for all our brethren in all the various locations, in every state, every region, and in every country as we are gathered together tonight for our workers' training. I pray the Lord himself will preach, will give us the appropriate word that will move us forward in the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, your word will be meaningful to every life in Jesus' name. Amen. And as the word trains us, transforms us, teaches us, and prepares us for great work in the kingdom henceforth, we pray we'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. We are praying, Lord, that your word will not be lost on any of us. The word will have impact, transformation impact, transforming impact in every life in Jesus' name. Help us to do the work the way you want the work done. Help us, Lord, to have the effect and the influence that we need to have on the people so that more will appreciate the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and many will come into the gospel and the power of the gospel will walk in more lives in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. you can see that we're coming to Isaiah chapter 53 and we're reading from verse 4 through to verse 6. Isaiah chapter 53. We're looking at it from verse 4, reading all through to verse 6. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That passage is talking about our Savior, about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it gives us the message, gives us the inspired message of the Lamb, the Lamb of God that takes away all the iniquities and the transgressions and the sins of the world is referred to as the lamb as we look at verse 7 it says in verse 7 he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter this is the one that john the baptist saw and uh, says the following day the next day john said jesus coming and he said behold the lamb of god that taketh the seas of the world away he is the lamb the Pascal lamb, the sacrificial lamb, he is the sin bearer, he is the savior. He says he was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. What we're reading here is the good news that God has provided. The good news of the Savior who died for us. The good news of the Savior who came and lived a perfect life and was qualified in the sight of God and because of that appointed, anointed and approved of God to be the Savior of the world. Tonight we're looking at the message, good news for all people through the Lamb good news for all people through the lamb the angel mentioned the news and the, and the angel said is good news for everyone in luke chapter 2 reading from verse 10 it says and the angel said unto them fear not 
For behold, I bring you good tidings, good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. The angel said, the birth of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, the arrival of Jesus, means good news. Good news for the whole world. Good news for the whole of humanity and good news for all the creatures of God. Fear not for behold, I bring you good news of great joy which shall be to all people which shall be to all people you want to underline that word all there in the might of god in the provision of god and in the program of god he has the good news for all people all people come back to isaiah chapter 53 and let us look at verse 6 isaiah chapter 53 we're looking at verse 6 it says all we like sheep have gone astray we have taught everyone his own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all why are we reading that verse again? That verse is peculiar. If you look at the first word in verse 6, what we just read now, what's the first word there? All. If you look at the last word in that verse 6, what's the last word there? All. That means then, as you open the, as you open the verse, as you close the verse, the Lord is saying, this is for all. In the might of God, he wants everyone saved. In the might of God, he has provided the Savior and salvation for everyone and for all. Look at that verse again. All we, like, all we, like sheep, have gone astray. That's like saying, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet, all of humanity men and women boys and girls the low and the high and the great and the small all people have seen and yet look at what the Lord has done we have done we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him on him the lamb on him the savior on him the sin bearer on him our substitute the lord the lord himself in his own mind in his own plan and in his own will salvation is provided for everyone and he says the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all providentially everyone to be saved and uh, because of the provision of God the plan of God everyone is a candidate for salvation look at what the New Testament says concerning that in Mark chapter 16 we find the language of Jesus the commission of Jesus and the commandment of Jesus to all his disciples where we're to take the, the gospel to it says in chapter 16 of Mark and verse 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world go ye into all the world already he died already he paid for our he paid a penalty already he bore our punishment already he provided salvation he died he was buried he rose again after that resurrection he now wanted the disciples to go who are we to go to are we to go to the Jews only or are we to go to the Gentiles, I we to go to the young, I we to go to the old, I we to go to some specific, specified people. He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You understand? Then he wants everyone saved, he wants everyone to come into the enjoyment, into the experience of this good news. Remember that what all is sacrificed for all. He paid the penalty for all and he is the sin bearer for all and he is the substitute for all and he is the savior for all he provided salvation for everyone and so as we preach the gospel today and we take the good news today from here to there we're not exempting anyone we're not uh, avoiding anyone we're saying this one must have the good news that one must have the good news because Jesus 
Jesus paid it all and he paid for all people. In Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 18. I want you to notice the word all and underline the word all and see that the sacrifice of Jesus, the salvation of Jesus and the good news of Jesus and the gospel, the glad tidings of Jesus is actually for all. In Romans chapter 5, verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. You understand that? As by the offense of Adam, as by the offense of the one that brought us physically, naturally into the world, because we're all the offspring of Adam. And as by the offense of that one man, Adam, then it says, a condemnation came upon all men. Look at the second part now. It says, even so, by the righteousness of one, that's the last Adam, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, that's our Savior, that's our Redeemer, that's the one that makes us to talk now and preach now about the good news. It says, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon tell me the next word there all men unto the justification of life is telling us that salvation is provided for everyone the offense came upon all and now justification the possibility of salvation has come upon all look at the intention of god in second peter chapter chapter 3 second peter chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 9 second peter chapter 3 we're looking at verse 9 it tells us in second peter chapter 3 looking at verse 9 the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering towards what not willing that any should perish not willing that any should perish take it off your mind maybe that one will never be saved maybe that one can never be saved maybe that one salvation is not meant for him maybe god has not provided salvation for this or for that it says in the mind of god if everything were left in the hand of the almighty god he wants everyone saved he is not willing that any should perish look at the last part of that verse it says but that tell me the word there tell me out aloud but that all should come to repentance your landlord your landlady that all shall come to repentance your headmaster and your teacher that all shall come to repentance your parents and the neighbors that all shall come to repentance that even the irreligious and the religious that all shall come to repentance it is good news for all people through the lamb through the lamb of god that taketh away the sin of the world that's the message we're looking at we're not just looking at the message we want the message to sink in and to go in into our hearts you know sometimes as we are members of the church and ministers in the church there are people who have been coming to the church for such a long time and they, they know some of the passages and they know some of the doctrines but they have not met jesus as their personal savior and we're not even talking to them we're assuming that everyone is saved why don't we make the effort and approach everyone everyone within the church even those who say that they are acting out that responsibility carrying out that responsibility and ask them have you got the good news have you experienced the good news have you possessed the good news do you know jesus as your personal savior when did that happen how did that happen and what change has come in your heart since you said you know the lord jesus christ let's be very definite about it to make sure that to start with all the people in the four corners and the four walls of our church building you know, that they know the lord that they have experienced this good news and then the people we meet regularly and we meet very often we meet them here we meet them there we meet them there we're very familiar with them understand everybody you see everybody you come across the 
gospel is for them. This good news is for them. Have you ever challenged them, the people you meet often? Can you tell me? We've been meeting very often about this good news we're talking about. Have you got this good news? Have you possessed this good news? Have you experienced this good news? Is the good news of salvation of the Savior as it works in your life? And then the people we meet occasionally, the moment you meet them, let whatever transaction may be in between you, let this one thing come clear and come through that they must have the good news of salvation, the good news of redemption, the good news of the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ impacting them and they having this definite experience. If I'm telling you to do that, I must do that myself. I'm asking you now, you cannot answer because you are many, but take this as a personal question to you. Have you experienced the good news of salvation? Oh, but I'm a worker. I'm not talking about that. Have you experienced the salvation of the Lord? Can you tell me if I were to confront you one on one, the day it happened, the time it happened, and the place it happened? Can you tell me if I were to confront you one on one, eyeball to eyeball, and I said, don't dilly dally, don't give me excuse. Tell me the change and the definite transformation that came to your life when you said, you urge the good news. Even though I cannot meet you one on one, I want you now to be thinking in your mind, have I got the good news? When would I say I got the good news? What assurance do I have that the good news is bringing fruit in my life? And since that time, have I held on to the good news? Am I holding on to the good news? And is the good news of salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ working mightily in me? Good news for all people through the Lamb. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the redemption of the penitent through the Lamb. The redemption of the penitent through the Lamb. I'm, I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 53 and I'm reading from verse 3. It says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we did as it were uh, he, uh, as it were we hid the faces from him he was despised and we esteemed him not surely he has borne our griefs that is the pain and the load and the punishment of our sins the punishment we should have borne he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows we did esteem him stricken smitten of god and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions our transgressions every man must have that testimony every man must have that confidence that he has born my transgressions so that the condemnation of those transgressions are not on you anymore and the spirit of God will be bearing witness in your heart your transgression in particular your sins in particular your iniquities in particular Christ bore them and the spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart and then you say the chastisement of my peace was upon him and with the stripes and I am healed. For all we like sheep have gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. You remember when you went astray. You remember your character, your behavior, your disposition, your language, and your, your actions that will say, uh uh, that's the action of somebody who has gone astray. That's the, uh, that's the character of somebody who has followed the way of Adam and has disobeyed. God had denied the commandment of God and you know you are part of the all that have gone astray but praise the Lord something happened and what, what happened we turned everyone his own way what was self-willed what was self-centered my way my will my conduct my desire what I want that's the character of everyone who has not met the Lord because we turned everyone 
on to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Everybody has experienced part one of that verse. All we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has experienced in the past the second part of that verse we have turned everyone his own way but now it will take a definite step of repentance a definite step of penitence a definite step of being sorry for the past and then being so sorry that I could go my own way that I could say no to the almighty God and I could say wait I cannot have you now I still want to please myself I still want to go on my own journey I still want to drink what I'd like to drink I still want to smoke what I want to smoke I still not I still want to have combat with the person I want to have combat with I still want to revenge I can I don't I don't have time for you now it's a pity that we made him to stay away but one day came in our lives when we said enough is enough sinning that's enough backsliding that's enough violence that's enough and drinking and smoking that's enough worldliness that's enough and then we said here is our iniquity here is our transgression here is the evil in our hand here is the sin the commodity we got from the hand of satan and we got from the world and we got from the first adam that will push us and drive us to hell and now we say all our iniquity will bundle them together we gave them to the lord and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all the moment you come repentance and the moment you come that you say you are sorry for all you've done you know that if you continue self-centered if you continue self-willed if you continue designing your sin holding on to your sin that if you continue to the very end of life that will drive you to hell and that will drive you to perdition therefore you turn around therefore you repent you become penitent and then you give your life to the lord and it says the Lord then lays all your iniquity upon him. Once again, you must remember the time it happened. I remember mine. You must remember how it happened. I remember for myself. And you must remember the change that came. The iniquity that would have drowned you in hellfire. The iniquity that would have destroyed you. That were presented to the Lord. And the Lord took that away. And the Lord laid all your iniquity upon him you must remember if you don't remember you have to go to Calvary again and then bring all the remembrance of your sin and you allow the Lord God Almighty Jehovah God in heaven to lay it upon Christ on your behalf we're coming to Romans chapter 3 in Romans chapter 3 I'm reading from verse 19 Romans chapter 3 we're looking at verse 19. It says in verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the Lord says, it says to them that are under the law. It says to them that are under the law. Who are those people? Everybody in the world who are under the law. How? Because there is a monitor in our heart. Anytime you say something that is not 100% factual, 100% truthful, that monitor, that please man in your mind, in your heart will say, ah, uh ah, -uh. but you know that's not true. You know you are deceiving people people you know you want that person to believe it like anytime we act out something something that is not right something that is of iniquity that's of sin something that transgresses the word of righteousness the monitor in our heart will say you know that's not true you know that's not right you know that you are going the way of darkness and the way of evil it's everyone because everyone has become guilty in the sight of the lord now we know that what things soever the Lord says, it says to them that are under the Lord that every mouth may be stopped, every mouth of an excuse maker may be stopped, every mouth of a hypocrite may be stopped, every mouth of a superficial religious man, religious woman may be stopped, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty.
guilty before God. All the world become guilty before God. Even little children, as they come to the age of accountability, and they know their right hand from their left hand, and they know light from darkness, and they know good from evil, and they know right from wrong, they become guilty in the sight of God. And the people that have not uh, darkened this doorstep of any church, they've not been in any church, in their conscience, they know that this is right, and they know that this is wrong. It says all the world become guilty, more so the people that read the Bible, and they see that this is the way of the Lord, and this is the way of righteousness, when after, before they are saved, before they are born again, and they go the wrong way, and they go the wrong path, that everyone becomes guilty in the sight of God. It gives us the summary in verse 23. Look at verse 23. For all have sinned educated man, for all have seen illiterate person, all have seen church man, all have seen irreligious man, all have seen the denominational man, denominational woman, all have seen the, the one in the religion on the other side, all have seen and come short of the glory of God. Everyone that has seen and come short of the glory of God. That's why we need to have the good news, because we are part of that all and that's why we need to proclaim we need to preach that good, good news to all people because all have sinned and if they remain in that condition remember all who have sinned and that's everyone come short of the glory of God if we die being short of the glory of God will be shut out of the glory of God will be shut out of the glory of heaven that's where Christ comes in. That's where the Lamb of God comes in. That's where your repentance comes in. That's where the repentance of every sinner comes in. Verse 24 now, it says, being justified freely by his grace. Salvation, we don't pay anything for that salvation. Christ has paid the price already. But then we have to leave darkness to come to the light. We have to open the door of our heart for Christ to come in, being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That redemption is in Christ. You cannot find redemption outside Christ no matter how you try, no matter what you do, the Father God in heaven has laid on him and on him alone, not an angel, on him alone, not on Gabriel, not on Michael, on him alone, not on the highest angels in heaven, on him alone, not on a human religious man, the Father God in heaven, the Lord has laid on him not on them, not on any apostle, not on Mary, not on any religious figure. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. If anybody is to be saved, is by having all your sin, all your transgression, all your iniquity laid upon him. And then it says, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth as a propitiation, is the peacemaker through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, for the cleansing, for the forgiveness of the sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say in verse 26, at this time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth on him. The justifier of the one that believes in him is born our sin, is taking our sin away. In First Peter chapter, chapter 3 verse 18, 
First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Remember, he is the very foundation of that good news. He is the very pillar of that good news. He alone, without the help of an angel or the help of a man, he, a, he alone is the foundation and the giver of that salvation, the good news that we have. In First Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. He suffered for sin. He had no sin. He was pure. He was holy. He was perfect. He was sinless. He was spotless. And yet it says Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He's the only one through a sacrifice that can bring us unto God. He is the only one through his substitution on the cross of Calvary that can bring us to Christ. And then it says, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. What do you do? What do I do? What do we do? That we will have this good news efficacious in our lives. This good news really transforming us and being a benefit to us. Uh, do you do anything or do we just say God has done everything? We go on in our career of sinning. We go on in our career of evil doing and then Christ has done everything. Not really. Not like that. You have a part to play. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 19. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 19. It says, Repent ye therefore and be converted. Therefore, because Christ died on the cross of Calvary, because Christ has paid the price already, because Christ has been smitching of God, is being our substitute, is being our sin bearer. Therefore, because the price is paid, because of that, repent and be converted. You know something? Uh, you cannot just say, uh, I've repented, I've turned away from my sin. We'll have to see the mark of conversion. We'll have to see the evidence of conversion. We'll have to see the reality of conversion. That really you have turned. You are no more in darkness. Your character will show conversion. Your attitude will show conversion. Your temper and temperament will show conversion. Your behavior will show conversion, not just in church, outside the church, in your home, in your school, in your place of work, everywhere you find yourself. People that knew you before and they know you now, they will know. They might not have been there when you knelt down and when you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, but from what they see light is stage of darkness and goodness is stage of evil right is stage of wrong truthfulness instead of falsehood because of what they can see they will know that conversion has taken place repentance and conversion they go together it says in that verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out very important that your sins may be blotted out. You know, in the sight of God, all sins we commit are recorded down. Whether people know it or not, your conscience, you know it, your mind, you know it, your brain can recollect it. Whether you can even remember or not, at the time it was done, it was reaching down. And if that record remains until you leave the world, the first thing you are going to face, the Lord will open the books and he will judge everyone that passes over to the other side according to the things that are written therein. It is at the time you come to Christ. It's at the time you turn away from your sin. It's at the time you bundle everything together and you say enough is enough. 
come, I must have conversion. I must have salvation. I must have a change. And then you trust in the blood of the Lamb that takes away all the sins of the world. And you say, this is mine. And all your iniquities are laid on Christ. It's at that point all your sins are blotted out. If they are not blotted out, Whatever testimony you give, that's just for us here to entertain us. That one does not have any recognition in heaven. If you have repented and you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, all your sins are blotted out and there is a testimony in heaven that that page is white, that page is clean, that page is now clear because the sins are blotted out. Look at that verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When that happens, there's refreshing in your heart. There there is a freshness in your heart. There's joy in your heart. The joy of salvation comes to you and anywhere you go, that's the very, the very first thing you are conscious of. I'm forgiven. My sins are blotted out. I'm a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. Look at verse 26. Unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus, Saint him to bless you. What kind of blessing? In turning away every one of you from his iniquities. When you are forgiven, your mind is turned away from those iniquities. You don't love them anymore. The things I used to do, I do them no more. The things I used to wear, I wear them no more. The places I used to go, I go there no more. And the world I used to embrace and I used to, you know, go there every night, I go there no more because he has turned your heart, he has turned your mind, he has turned your will, he has turned your desires away from your sins. That's the good news that he gives us redemption as we are penitent before the Lord and that uh, repentance is genuine. In fact, the repentance, look at the manifestation of that repentance. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. It says, for godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation. When you hear the word of God and you see that your iniquity will drive you to hell and your iniquity will die, drive you to perdition and your iniquity will make you suffer forever and ever, when the Holy Ghost applies that in your heart, there is sorrow in your heart. I've done evil. So I've been preparing myself as firewood for everlasting fire. How did I do that? How could I have been doing that? How could I be so blind? You have sorrow for your sin. And it is that that is genuine repentance. It's not just that, okay, I did that. But you know, it was all pleasure and it was all good. Anyway, since you want me to receive Christ, Jesus Christ, come into my heart. It doesn't happen that way. You must hate the sin. In fact, you almost hate yourself for those things you did in those times. You're not bragging on them. I used to do this when I was tough, when I was a guy, and when I was... Everybody knew me, and they couldn't fool around with me because this is the way I was. That one is not saved. The one that is saved is the one that has repented. Is the one that is penitent in his heart. And it says in that verse 10, For godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. We need repentance, and it is that repentance that makes us now the children of God, and how we want to follow God now, how we want to live 
live the life of a real child of God and the life of a new creature in Christ now that God has been gracious enough to forgive us. It tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 18 for as much as you know that you were not redeemed, you were not purchased, you were not converted, you were not saved with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ that's the word redeemed purchased converted saved with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot what's the result of that look at verse 23 being born again being born again is like a child had been inside the mother and a time comes a day comes he is born into the world not gradually not that you know i'm being born leg come out today and then a uh, hand will come out and after one week and then another part come out. eventually over three months the child is now born being born not at all the same thing uh, in the spiritual sense when you are born again you are born again i dropped some pieces of cigarette today and then in one week i dropped some other things and you know I couldn't shed off that line. I couldn't shed off falsehood. I couldn't shed off a um, kind of uh, deception. And it took me about, after I was born, born, born again, uh, after six months, you know, I was able to then cut off some real terrible lies. But only white lies remained. And then after one year, as I was being born and being born and being born again, all those white lies, after one year cleared off, that's not being born again when you are born again is the grace of God that comes to you and then he takes all your sin he takes all your iniquity he bundles everything together and he lays them on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are born again you are out of darkness and you come into the light and then that salvation becomes so real that anyone that sees you will know that at such a time in such a place and in this way that salvation took place being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which lives and abides forever I pray that for us to start with a salvation will be definite a salvation will be genuine a salvation will not be make believe that you know your local pastor is saying well, I, I really want to be positive. I want to say, he says he's born again, and I want to accept that he's born again. Only that, you know, the character I see confuses me. I hear his testimony. And, you know, when he, when he has chance to interpret the Bible or answer question or maybe say something in church, he says it correctly, and he says he's born again, but his character is what is giving me concern. There'll be no doubt at all when if any man be in Christ, any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, and behold, tell me the rest, all things are become new. That happens, that's redemption, that's righteousness, that's uh, salvation, and that salvation is for the penitent through the Lamb of God. We're coming to point number two in Isaiah chapter 53. I'm reading from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 53 we're looking at verse 3 he is despised and rejected of men rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he is despised and we esteemed him not he is despised and rejected of men point number two the rejection and perdition of the lost the rejection and perdition 
of the laws. As you come back to this, Isaiah chapter 53, look at verse 6 again. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's the good news. He wants everyone saved. He wants everyone repentant. He wants everyone penitent. He wants everyone pardoned. He wants everyone converted. He wants everyone in the book of life. But unfortunately, there are people who reject and because they reject the good news the good news is still available for everyone and the good news is still available for them but they reject and they say no we will not have salvation through this one but he's the only one that can give us salvation there is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved only through him we can have salvation there's no other redeemer there's no other sin bearer but these people reject and when they reject like that god has no choice i wanted to save you i wanted you to get to heaven I wanted you, Christ, my son, my only begotten son, to be your savior, but you would not have that. Is that possible? Can anybody so reject what the heavenly father has ordained for him? We're coming to Matthew chapter 27. And we're reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 27, reading from verse 24. Then Pilate saw, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his son before the multitude saying I am innocent of the blood of this just person see ye to it then answered all the people and said his blood be on us and on our children understand that little word there on he didn't say his blood be for us for our salvation our forgiveness for our redemption is blood be for us for us for our cleansing and for our regeneration is blood be for us for our acceptance unto god they said no not for us on us well they said they'll bear the guilt they said they'll bear the condemnation they said they rejected him they didn't want a salvation the good news was available and the salvation was available but they said no we will not have it chapter 23 matthew chapter 23 and we're reading from verse 30 uh, from verse 33 matthew chapter 23 reading from verse 33 it says in verse 33 ye serpents and ye generation of vipers how can ye escape the damnation of hell everybody could escape everybody could have escaped and all the people that have sinned they could have looked at the lord jesus christ the sin bearer and they could have escaped the damnation the condemnation the perdition and the eternal judgment that would have come upon them but they rejected and look at verse 30 i'm reading from verse 37 oh jerusalem jerusalem that the killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee how often would i have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her children under her wings and ye would not there's something about rejecting salvation rejecting redemption and rejecting the good news that it prepares such a person or such a group of people for hellfire because they 
rejected. How often would I have gathered you? Salvation is for everyone. He was bearing the iniquity of everyone and he even prayed for everyone. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But he said, no, we don't have, we don't want that forgiveness. We know what we're doing. We don't want that salvation. We don't want you to bear our sin. You can bear the sins of other people but not their own sin. They rejected salvation and they went into perdition. In Jeremiah chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 6, we're reading from verse 16. It says in verse 16, God says, The Lord stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way and walk therein. Stand ye in the old paths and ask for the old way. Where is the way that leads to heaven? Where is the narrow way that leads to eternal salvation? Where is the narrow path that leads to comfort at last? That leads to joy at last? That leads to life eternal at last? And the Lord said, stand there and ask. And then ask for the old way and walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. And they said, what did they say? Tell me, tell me out aloud. We will not walk therein. Those were Israelites or Jewish people. They were the people that God made a covenant with their father Abraham. And he wanted them to even, not just receive blessing, but to be a blessing to all people, all the families of the earth. And the Lord said, stand in the way. Look at your way. This way is crooked. This way is evil. This way is sinful. This way is pernicious. This way will lead you to eternal death, eternal damnation. Stand. The way is there. The good way is there. Ask for the good way. And then when you see the good way, don't just know it in your head. Don't just know it mentally. And walk therein. And they said, we will not walk therein. They couldn't find rest. They couldn't find salvation because they rejected. Look at verse 17. Also, I said, watch men over you seen her king to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hack him. And they were full of self. They were rigid. They said, we're not going to take that. All that you are saying, whatever word you are preaching, that's the way of life. That's the way of salvation. You know, God cannot force salvation, redemption on anyone, forgiveness on anyone. He opens the book of life. He says, now come. Will you yield? Will you surrender? Will you give up your iniquity? Will you repent? Will you believe on my only begotten son? I'm here to forgive you. I can forgive you now. I can take away all your sins now. The book is open. I want to write your name in the book of life. They say, no thanks. I don't want that. I'll to continue my way. I enjoy my sin, I enjoy my iniquity, I enjoy my self-will more than you offer. What can God do? When somebody rejects the way of life and the way of salvation is finished for him, I pray it will not be finished for you. Amen. Look at Jeremiah chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 44 verse 16. As for the word thou hast spoken to us in the name of the Lord. Look at these people. He said, Jeremiah, you know what? If nobody can confess, if nobody will confess that you are a man of God, we know you are a man of God. If nobody is openly saying you have heard the word of God and you're declaring that word of God unto us, we can tell it's the word of God. We know that is not your word. We know the good news is not your private opinion. Opinion. We know it is coming from God. Look at that verse 16. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. 
You can go to other people, other simple-minded people, other people who are looking for salvation so eagerly. You can go to other people, other people who will just take everything, say, repent, and then they repent, be convicted, then they are convicted, and confess your sins. Yes, they confess their sins, and turn over, and say, Lord, I'm for you, you are for me, I want your mercy. And those people will accept like that, but for us, you know us, we will not accept they rejected the good news and now they are lost forever and ever. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. In Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 1, here it tells us, Hebrews chapter 2, reading from verse 1, Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed. Therefore, because we know what has happened to other people and we know the perdition that is coming on Christ's rejectors, we know the perdition that is coming upon the people that have refused the good news. Therefore, we ought to give them more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep because it says for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation how shall we escape? How shall we escape the judgment of God? How shall we escape the indignation and the wrath of God? How shall we escape the condemnation, the damnation? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the force began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? It says we're not ignorant of the message of salvation is it was spoken by the Lord and then it was confirmed unto us by those apostles by those first preachers that heard it directly from the Lord Jesus and the people that gladly received in the word they were saved and baptized about 3,000 souls in one day if other people have accepted why are we rejecting don't we understand the perdition that will come upon the rejectors of the gospel the rejectors of the good news the rejectors of the salvation of God in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 Hebrews chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 1 let us therefore fear lest he promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you any of you shall become so familiar with the word of God any of you shall become so resistant and so rigid any of you shall shall repel the word of the good news lest any of you should seem to come short of it for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them but the word preached did not profit them the word preached did not profit them the word expounded did not profit them the word explained did not profit them the word applied did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it did it accept it with faith they didn't accept it with good response. They didn't accept it knowing uh, today is the day of salvation and that salvation is for me. If I miss this day, I, I cannot vouch for tomorrow. I cannot say what will happen tomorrow. If the Spirit of God convicting you today, if you reject him, if you drive him away and you say not today, Felix said to Paul, not today, I will say sent for you at a more convenient time that more convenient time never came if you're going to accept this is the time to accept if you're going to be saved this is the day of salvation and this is the day of redemption this is the day we call upon the lord we're not sure of another day but you know for these people they did not accept it did not profit them it did not mix with faith with them that heard it for in verse 3 
pray for we have believed we which have believed do enter into rest it is when we believe it's when we turn away from sin and we believe on the lord jesus christ and we said yes lord everything you have said to me is correct what you have condemned in my life i accept that and what you are telling me to turn around and to believe on the lord jesus christ with conviction and with dedication and with commitment in my heart i turn unto the lord and i believe on the lord jesus christ with all my heart all my soul all my mind it is says we which have believed do enter into rest as he said as i have sworn in my wrath as i have sworn in my anger as i have sworn in my indignation as i have sworn in my judgment if they shall enter into my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world although the work were finished on uh, from the foundation of the world the salvation was provided and the sin bearer has been approved and appointed and anointed although everything is available yet these ones who have rejected will not enter into his rest i pray that will not happen to us that will not happen to our family that will not happen to the people we know in Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, we're reading from verse 15. It says, when the word comes to you, there is but one thing to do, just obey, just obey. If you're on your way to heaven, and if it's for that heaven you sigh, the message of life, the message of eternal life will come to you. Don't push it to another day. Don't push it to another time as the word calls faith and duty demands just obey just obey just obey it's the way the only way the gospel way when his message reaches you don't push it off and say another time another day if there's anything to repent of this is the time to repent of that thing it says in hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God looking diligently the grace of God is there but you know somebody can fail of that grace of God somebody can say that grace of God I'm not ready now and if he's not ready now he says God I'll call you when I'm ready and God says you know I'm the creator of the heavens and the earth I'm the king of kings and the lord of lords and you are a speck of dust and then I'm calling you, I'm offering salvation to you, and you say, not today, God, I will send for you when I have time for you. God may never respond to that person again because he arrogates to himself a greater authority than the almighty God and he says I'm not ready now that's why it says be very careful lest any of you fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and, and, and thereby many be defiled in verse 16 lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, afterward, when he said, I'm ready now, I want to claim, I want to have the benefits of the birthright, I'm ready now, regeneration, I'm ready, salvation, I'm ready the blessing of abraham and isaac i'm ready and all the things that the father has provided i'm ready you know it says you know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing he was rejected if you reject god at the time is at your doorstep and is knocking at the door 
and is saying, look at what I did for you. Look at my only begotten son. Look at the sin bearer. Look at the salvation. Look at the savior. Look at the redemption. Look at what I've provided. If you say no, I don't want to think about that now. I have something more important now. More important than God. More important than the offer of salvation. More important than what the sin bearer has provided. You know, afterward, he found no place of repentance, though he saw it carefully with tears it's not just tears it's not just desire it's not just prayer when the lord knocks at the door that's the time to say lord here am i have mercy on me otherwise a person could go into perdition when he rejects the offer of the word of god and the offer of the good news over and over we're looking at second peter chapter 3 second peter chapter 3 and i'm reading from verse 6 and verse 7 second peter chapter 3 verse 6 whereby the world that was then being overflowed with water perished but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men remember he wants everybody saved remember the Lord, the Father, Jehovah God in heaven has laid the iniquity of us all on him. Remember, potentially everybody could be saved and yet there are people who reject, there are people who neglect, there are people who refuse, there are people that are bold enough to say no to God. And eventually, God will have to say no to them. I pray it will not happen to you. Yeah. Point number one, the redemption of the penitent through the Lamb. That's the only way redemption can come. That's the only way salvation can come. That's the only way regeneration can come. The redemption of the penitent, of the repentant, of the people that turn away from their sins, of the people that call upon the Lord, and of the people that say they are done through with the way of sin and the evil of sinning finished. They are not going to go that way again and through what the Lamb of God has done. Salvation now becomes available. Point number two is the rejection and the perdition of the loss. Point number three, our reformation and pursuit throughout life. Our reformation and pursuit throughout life we're coming to isaiah chapter 53 and i'm reading from verse 10 isaiah chapter 53 and we're reading from verse 10 it says in some in isaiah chapter 53 verse 10 yet it pleased the lord to bruise him he has put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It's talking about the effect. It's talking about the result of what Christ has done and the pleasure of the Lord, the salvation of humanity. It's done that already and there are people that are coming, they are coming into the kingdom and the Lord is satisfied with what he can see. Look at verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The travail of his soul in the garden of Gethsemane. The travail of of his soul as he surrendered himself not my will but thine be done the travail of his soul as he cried on the cross my god my god why have you forsaken me the travail of his soul as he sacrificed and gave up everything the result of that now the multitudes that have their transformation and their regeneration and their righteousness because what the lord has done he shall see the travail of 
his soul and he shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many people coming to the knowledge of the savior he died for us he shed his blood for us and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin and people who hear that and believe that and they're justified because he shall bear their iniquities that's what the lord has done and through that he gives us reformation he gives us transformation if anybody says he has come to christ the result of that is that there's transformation there's reformation hebrews chapter 9 verse 10 in hebrews chapter 9 looking at verse 10 it tells us of the change that has taken place that takes place anytime every time his soul comes to the lord and he wants to see the pleasure of the lord fulfilled in his life in hebrews chapter 9 verse 10 which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and canal ordinances imposed on them look at this until the time of reformation all the old covenant continued until the time of reformation all those animal sacrifices continued until the time of reformation all the washings and all the things all the rituals of the old uh, tabernacle worship they continued until the time of reformation that's until the time of christ when he came and he sacrificed himself and he shed his blood and that blood is now for our transformation and for reformation it says in verse 11 but christ being calm and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle that is to say not of this building neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained what kind of redemption eternal redemption for us that's the eternal redemption that brings reformation that brings transformation that brings such a change of life and it says for if by the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh how much more how much more if the old covenant could produce a person like enoch if the old covenant could produce somebody like joseph if the old covenant can produce could produce somebody like Jews, like a uh, like um, like um, like uh, uh, this uh, I, I remember the joshua and caleb if the old covenant could produce all those people that came to the lord isaiah and jeremiah and ezekiel if the old covenant could produce people like that it says how much more shall the blood of christ the blood of the lamb and the blood of the animals produce all those people and they were cleaner and they were righteous and they came to a new life in the lord how much more now shall the blood of christ who through the everlasting eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god and for this cause he is the mediator of the new testament new covenant that by the means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament day which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance look at what the old covenant did and look at the people the old covenant uh, produced and now look at what christ has done and look at the regeneration he gives and look at the salvation he offers look at the new life he offers look at the holiness he can produce look at the sanctification he can produce in us and look at the eternal redemption christ can produce in our lives now reformation and the pursuit that we have not throughout 
our lives and look at what the blood of Jesus does we're looking at Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12 wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood when you, when you come across the blood of Jesus always remember all those people of the old covenant like Ezekiah that said I've walked in a perfect way before you because of the blood of animals in the old covenant but now we come to the new covenant and if we actually believe in the precious blood of Jesus he said wherefore Jesus also that he Christ might sanctify might purify might make holy the people that come to him through his own blood is suffered without the gate look at verse 20 in verse 20 it says now the God of peace who through who brought a gain the dead uh, up from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant through the blood of the everlasting covenant this new covenant this everlasting covenant is higher is greater and is uh, more efficacious than the covenant of old it says now through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will you know when we're coming to the kingdom through the blood of jesus christ he enables us he empowers us and he engages us and he actually emboldens us that now we can do the will of God and we will not say well I know that's the will of God but I don't have the grace the grace is there I know that's the will of God to live a righteous life and to live a pure life and to pursue the way of righteousness and the way of the Lord every moment of our lives every day of our lives every, every, every period of our lives to go the way of righteousness and the way of holiness and we cannot say you know I cannot even Enoch in the old covenant did not say I cannot even Moses in the old covenant did not say I cannot and Joshua and Caleb in the old covenant did not say they can they could not and Samuel did not say I cannot we come to the new covenant and through the blood of the everlasting the blood of the everlasting covenant it makes us perfect now to do his will, his goodwill, walking in you and that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. He sets us free. He will set you free. In First John chapter 1, First John chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 5. First John chapter 1, we're looking at verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and, and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That God is holiness and in him is no sin at all that god is power and in him is no weakness at all that god is all righteous and in him is no unrighteousness at all this then is the message which we have heard of him and we declare that same message unto you that god is light and in him is no darkness at all if we say we have have fellowship with him and walk in darkness if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in sin if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in falsehood if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in hypocrisy if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in idolatry we lie and do not the truth but if we walk in the light as he is in the light if we walk in the light we say we're born again we say we're children of God we say the good news has taken effect in our lives if we walk in the light every time every moment whether people are there or not if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ is son what does he do 
cleanseth us from all sin. How many sins? All sin. That's what it does. We're looking at First John chapter three, verse five. First John chapter three, verse five. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, not to increase our sins, not to pamper petals in our sin, not to excuse our sin, not to leave us in our sin. You know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin whosoever abideth in him. Somebody there tell me. Sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness, righteousness is not something we just keep in the mind. Righteousness is not something we just keep in, in the notebook. We do it. We practice it. We perform it. We go about doing it. We get to the office, do it. You get to your home, do it. And you are in the church, do it. You are with fellow members, do it. Righteousness is something we do. Not something we hide inside us. You know, I have righteousness. Let's see it. Practice it. Perform it. Do it. It says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. Even as he is righteous, he that committeth sin. What? It's of the devil. Whatever name you call yourself. Whatever title you're carrying. You know, in the kingdom of God, titles don't matter that much. And when we get to the presence of God, titles will not matter. What were you? When you were in the world, were you this title, that title, that, that will not matter. The thing that will matter is that you heard the good news. You accepted the good news. You embraced the good news. You experienced the good news that Jesus Christ is Savior, that Jesus Christ is a sin bearer, and the acceptance and the experience of that good news worked out something in your life. Title, forget about that. And think about is your name in the book of life as the blood of Jesus effected something in, uh, in your life. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. When he enters into our lives, every work of the devil, he will destroy in Jesus' name. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. You will not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. That's you. I said that's you. First Peter chapter 2 verse 21. First Peter chapter 2 verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, here is our calling, as a calling, even here unto what ye called, here is your first calling, here is your primary calling, here is your indispensable calling, here is your practical calling, here is a calling that God is watching over. And it says, for even here unto what ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Now we are born again. Now we are children of God. Now the good news has come to us and we have accepted the good news. We have embraced the good news. And Jesus was not going about with anger, with hatred, with animosity, with malice. And here is our calling. He left us an example that we will follow his footsteps. Jesus was not going about with white lies, trying to cover up this. You know, you, you, somebody tells a little lie, 
By the time you want to discover that, he needs another lie to cover that up. By the time you want to discover that, he needs another lie to cover that up. Christ went about truthful. Is faithful and true. And this is our calling that we follow his footsteps. Christ was not going about what lost, the lost of the flesh. He wants to do this, he wants to do this. Why it not for the light of day that will not allow him, will not allow her to practice that. Christ was not like that. And Christ has left us an example that will follow after his steps. He was about seeking the lost and saving the people that ought to be saved. And he said, occupy till I come. The pursuit of her life throughout now is to do what he did and to continue in the lifestyle that he has left for us. And I pray that that will be replicated, reproduced in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. In Revelation chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 14, we're reading from verse 4. And it says, these are they, uh, these are they, which were not defiled with women. They were not defiled with pornography. And it says, for they are virgins, they are pure, they are righteous, and they are transparent through and through. These are they which follow the Lamb, that's a pursuit, which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goes, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile that's a pursuit no hip no falsehood no lying and there is no girl for they are without fault before the throne of God that's how we're to pursue and that's how we're to follow the Lamb. that's the life we are to live and the Lord grant us abundant grace in Jesus name Revelation chapter 19 verse 7 Revelation chapter 19 verse 7 let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him for the marriage of the Lamb is calm, and his wife has made herself ready. You'll be part of the bride. You'll be part, part of that pure bride of Christ in Jesus' name. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Those are the people, they have looked at Calvary and they have heard the good news. They have embraced the good news. They have accepted the good news and the good news has become effective, efficacious in their lives. And the Lord is looking at them and you will see the effect of his sacrifice and his soul will have pleasure in you. His soul will be glad glad that you came and you received everything the good news has to offer. The good news salvation is available whosoever will may come. Sanctification is available whosoever will can consecrate and receive the power of the Holy Ghost is available. He has gone to be with the Father and being on the right side of the Father he has shed forth this which he now see and hear. The gifts of the Spirit are available and righteousness and a pure life and a straightforward life, a transparent life is available and passion for souls and zeal for the kingdom of God is now available. All is effectively given and provided on the cross of Calvary and God is happy when you say, I know you provided that for me, I want it. I know you provided that for me, I want it. But for the people that say no I don't want that I'm saved and that's enough for me um, I'm this and that's enough for me I have title I have position that's enough for me God is not well pleased that you provide something and anybody will reject I will not reject 
everything Calvary has provided. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, that's for me. That's for me. I want to move on. Have you exhausted Calvary? Have you exhausted the good news? Have you exhausted all the provisions of the Lord? Why don't you say, oh Lord, I want everything that Calvary has provided. Everything you have provided for me. I need more cleansing and I need more righteousness and I need more purity and I need more power. I need more passion in my life. I need the reproduction of the life of Christ to me. I want to have everything you have for me. Everything you provided on Calvary. I want everything whatsoever you need of what Calvary has provided. Ask him. Believe him. He will give it unto you.